Welcome to the Content Strategy Interviews Podcast. Each week, we talk with accomplished content strategy experts to share their wisdom with our friends in the content community. And now, here's your host, Larry Swanson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode number 25 of the Content Strategy Interviews Podcast. Really happy today to have on the show Jared Spool. Jared is a uh, a, a legend in the user experience world. He's been he's been doing it before since before it was a field. Uh, I think uh, he's it's safe to say he was there at the start of it. Uh, so he's best known as the founder of the user interface engineering uh, company. Uh, his I'm not sure how long ago that was started, but it's been around a little while. And more recently, a couple of years ago, he founded a school, a, 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 like a university, I guess for for. Um, uh, con- for uh, for user experience professionals called Center Center down in Chattanooga. Uh, but I'll let Jared tell you a little bit more about uh, what he's up to these days and uh, a little bit more about his background. Uh, 1988. That's when we started UIE. Um, Center Center was started in 2013 and we merged in 2016. Oh, okay. So, so we're now Center Center UIE. Nice. <laughs> Very cool. Um, well, let me tell you. So, and I guess uh, maybe you can talk about it in the context of the Center Center curriculum or just in general, how you think content strategy, well, first of all, how would you define content strategy? And then how would you contextualize it within the field of user experience design? Well, I would ask a content strategist. That's how I would to find content strategy. It's easier when you let somebody else do it. Um, but uh, to me, content strategy is, is all the work that has to do with the words. You know, from a, a UX perspective, a user experience perspective, uh, it's very easy for designers to, to, to just focus on the delivery of the stuff without thinking about what the stuff is. And so the trap that people fall into is that they're, they're basically, you know, Karen McGrain has this great saying of, of, you know, it's, it's like creating a beautiful gift box, but never putting a gift in it. Um, And a lot of design work can fall into that trap where you're putting where you're creating this beautiful GIF box, um, but you're never you're never figuring out what the gift is and who it's for and whether it's a meaningful gift and does it always will it always have meaning and all those things and so to me content strategy is is all those things um, thinking about how you figure out what content will make it best what the different forms of that content needs to be, the different contexts that that content has to show up, when that content goes away, um, all those things. Right. You talked, um, you mentioned that that Karen McGrain gift, I think it was, I read a whole bunch of stuff preparing for this, so apologies if I'm conflating things here. (laughs) But that's um, okay. I think, um, but you you should, you should, you should do all your homework. That's very good. Um, but one of the things I think it was, um, anyhow, it was, there was an article you did about how content and design are inseparable, um, uh, mm-hmm. that the, the two of them go together. And I think that's where you, that's where I first saw you talk about the Karen McGrain story about the gift, which I love. You could take that metaphor all over the place. Like how much thought went into that gift? How, uh, exactly. The, the content as a gift is a great thing, but the, um, but I think it hasn't always been that way. There are still designers who uh, just think lorem ipsum placeholders, stick it in there, get going. How um, how how have you seen content and design sort of come together as disciplines like content strategy and content design and content structure and UX practice? Have those is that a relatively new thing, or is it something that's just been identified? Or how 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 do you articulate that relationship? Um, I don't think it's a new thing. Um, Content has always had to think about its context. Or I mean, design has always had to think about its context, right? So, so design um, is, uh, is about 
uh, you know, you, if you want to design a park, right, you could just take a bunch of trees and say, okay, now that's a park, it, you know, just a, a plot of land and say that's a park. But no, you, you start to think about, well, wait a second. Some parts of the park should have easy to walk areas and some parts should, maybe there are trails, there should be things to explore. Um, some of those should be well marked. Some of them maybe shouldn't be so well marked. Um, uh, there should be open areas. There should be wooded areas. There should be benches. There should be trash cans. You know, now you get into all this sort of infrastructure thing. Uh, if you're going to have grassy areas, you have to have a way to cut the grass, which means you have to have an access road for the lawn mowers to get there, which means you have to have a place to put the lawn mowers. You don't want that, you know, the places to put the lawn mowers are sort of ugly. So you don't want them to be in the middle of the park. So, so there's, there's, there's all this sort of stuff that has to sort of emerge and, and you can't just say, well, we're going to make a beautiful park and not think about all those things. And so I think that, uh, on the, that design is always thought of content. If you think that, that, you know, a lot of what we consider to be visual design today came out of the graphic communications world. Graphic communications was, you know, producing everything from posters to annual reports. Well, those aren't designed without the content at all, right? So, so I mean, you can't design a poster without the content. You can't design an annual report without the content. There, there's nothing to do. So, um, so, so it's always, it's, they've always had this relationship. Where things got problematic was that that content was always static. In, in the world of the annual report, it's sure there's a new annual report every year, but you redesign the annual report every year and an art director created a new annual report. A magazine had an art director that created a new magazine with every issue. And it's not the case that you open the, mag you open the physical magazine and the article changes out from one month to the next. You know, once that magazine goes out of the building, it is and into someone's life it stays exactly the same forever but websites don't do that and software doesn't do that software allows you to replace content into a template nothing else really has that property in real life and that messed us up for a while because we got so fixated on the templates, we forgot that there was content that was supposed to live inside them. And, and I think that, that that was a giant step backwards for design for a while, and content strategy sort of shook the cage and said, no, no, <laughs> yes, you can swap out content in the same thing, but there's actually a strategy to it. That strategy has to be intentional. Mm -hmm. It's part of the design. Well, it comes back, I think we all come at this from different directions, and I come out of the publishing world, for example, but you've been pretty ensconced. I mean, your original career, you were in, um, uh, out of the computer world, right? That you were doing user interface stuff for... Uh, well, yeah, for, except for, I was doing publishing, right? So I was writing software for publishers. Uh, I, was, I was doing publishing software and, and desktop software, and I worked on the first email systems and the first spreadsheets and word processors. So, um, and typesetting systems and things like that. So, okay. so your, your, your background is more like mine than I might have imagined, I guess. That, but I think the thing, the, the point I was trying to get there is that I don't have that giant owl behind me that you seem oh. to have. Oh, is that showing up in my, oh, good. Yeah. I always shut yeah. <laughs> I'm at a co-working space in Seattle, uh, that I, um, uh, there's a moose on the other wall, but the lighting's not. I prefer the moose. Oh, good. I, I was, I was, I was going to be embarrassed because your whiteboard is so empty. I thought, my gosh, this guy has no ideas. No, it's it's a shared room. I have all all the ideas are in my computer. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, got it. But anyhow, but I wanted to to get at that. Um, I think everybody, we're all at varying places on that journey of understanding what you just talked about. How we've gone, we've gone from static 
uh, templatized uh, sort of content. So now we have like, as uh, um, well, Sarah Walker Betcher would call it content everywhere. And we have to be prepared to, to have content, not just in mobile devices, but maybe a voice interface to get to it. Uh, uh, oh yeah. Go up anywhere. Um, and, and yet like uh, part of what you're just talking about also reminded me of like how, um, uh, crummy i guess a lot of cmss can be in that they sort of impose they they're maybe a half a step into that world of their dynamic they're gener generated by a database but they still have that sort of templatized um like the old it guy in the background making you do things a certain way kind of model um do you and i think content strategy both content strategists and designers i'm going to guess are pushing back at that do you see much progress in that world do you see uh, progress from the technical side of things to help both publishers, designers, content strategists. Oh, sure. I, I think that that um, uh, there's a big push. Uh, Vox just published the designers at Vox just published their new publishing system and how they created. They took five separate publishing apps that that a writer or an editor had to use at some point and they, they unified them in a single set of functionality with a common design system. And they really sat down and, and did a lot of work on the publishing of things because the tools that they had organically cobbled together in their history were so crude. And, um, uh, that, uh, I think there's a lot of work happening in that. New York Times just redid their internal system. Uh, ProPublica just changed their internal system. There's a tremendous amount of work because uh, journalism is moving so much faster now that uh, they can't screw around with really inefficient tools. And a lot of the tools that they have haven't changed since the 90s and have been organically modified to do things like take headlines and tweet them out, but they, they're so clumsy to work with and so fragile that they, they, they don't work well at all. Right. And that's, that kind of gets it. Um, when we think about content, like what are we even talking about? I think a lot of people have always thought about like the website content or um, like in the case of a, of an e-commerce site, like the, um, the product catalog or whatever it might be. But now we have this need both for integration on the back end that all the, content is accounted for and then out of the front end you have not just you're not just publishing it to a website but you're publishing it to all these other devices but also you're publishing to different purposes the marketing people want to have compose their tweets and the, that kind of is that what the vox system did did it integrate some of that um like content promotion stuff into it as well yeah i'm uh i'm not 100 percent sure what the vox system redesign did uh in terms of the underlying software. Um, I focused more on the process by which they did it. Um, uh, but it, but yeah, I mean that the publishing is no longer sitting down, banging out four graphs and, and, and running across the room to the editor saying, Hey boss, I got this in just before the deadline. I mean that, that that's gone away. That, that the, the, uh, um, uh, the Clark Kent newsroom is no, it no longer exists. And <laughs> a quick aside on that. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, last couple weeks ago, um, some friends showed uh, the movie broadcast news, which right. was in the late eighties. And it had, there was one scene where a woman's dramatically running down the hall, banging into things, trying to get the videotape to the producer just you know in time so exactly that we're yeah way past that um yeah and so so because because we're we're no longer there the um the newsroom and other publishing things uh are in this bigger sort of editorial flow thing and and once you start to to go down the nasty road of what's our editorial flow you begin to realize that there is no unilateral single editorial flow that um, uh, something that's a, a 20,000 word thought piece has a very different editorial flow than something that is, you know, 
responding to the president's latest tweet. And, you know, the, 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 and the tools necessary are there because, you know, in the, in the thought piece, the newsroom has to do fact checking and they're doing art direction and they're, uh, uh, really taking, uh, uh, a story editing approach to it and, and, and looking to see, is this the most compelling elements? What can we do? What do we still need to research? Whereas in the response to the latest tweet, you know, you have to look up what fact he lied about and then you have to, you know, find a, a, a link to it and then you publish that. Right. And, um, and, and so the tools you need to do that are completely different. Right. Hey, that gets into something else I wanted to ask you about, which is, you know, the, this the little meta, I guess, in the sense, but I'm wondering how and whether uh, UX practice is being applied to those kinds of things like editorial workflows in big organizations. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And how do you have any examples of that? Like like big organizations that, that um, because like, as you mentioned, every. Oh, you should talk to. Uh, um, why is her name escaping me? Uh, uh, Mandy Brown over at at, at Vox. Oh, I think, I think Sarah Walker Betcher mentioned her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They used to work together on a list apart. Okay, yeah. I'll um maybe she'll help. Sh maybe she'll be at Confab. Um, anyhow, so interesting. Uh, Mandy, maybe, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but they're doing uh, amazing work on their editorial f workflow. I know the Times is doing work. I know that that uh uh. The Knight Ritter has a whole bunch of stuff on on this. There, there's there's a ton of folk working on this. This is this is a big deal. NPR uh, um, uh, has incredible resources put on this. Right. Um, so so yeah, no. Uh, the Guardian, the BBC. Um, uh, I, I think any any major publishing house has to be thinking about editorial workflow stuff at this point. And they feel, um, completely, uh, like this is, this is the priority because this is the thing that prevents them from getting the scoop out. Right. Yeah. That you, yeah, you, the instant gratification demand is so high now and the competition to break stories must be huge. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then, and then, Tracking what worked, right? Being able to go back and look at, well, when we did it this way, we got this response. When we did it this other way, we got this other response. How do we run the experiments? Mm -hmm. I guess that's kind of what I was getting at, too, is that that's sort of built in UX research into your editorial process where you have that kind of feedback coming back. Are, do, are there, um, how do, do pe most people do that sort of uh, by customizing their CMS or by using, um, third-party measurement to like everything Google Analytics stuff. Yeah, there aren't any good third-party tools for this because the 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 every every thing is bespoke, right? The problem with any two news publishing organizations is that their entire operation runs completely different one from the other. So, uh, so you can't have a generic package right. to to measure stuff. Now that said, I know that NPR has a whole bunch of tools that they give to their affiliates to help their affiliates be more effective. But the affiliates are basically adopting the NPR process instead of building their own. And so the tools work if that's what you're going to do. But if you're not going to adopt the NPR process, those tools are not going to be very effective for you. Got it. And I guess that's where, so when you say how, like how customized it has to be for every place, that maybe gets back to the importance of having people who are versed in the process working in each of these outfits and organizations, which is probably why we're seeing the growth of UX and content strategy and disciplines like that. Um, are you seeing strong demand for people with those kinds of skills? That, like that you Oh, yeah. I mean, that's why we started a school. Yep. was was because there was way more demand than there was supply and we um we knew we could do a uh a good job of training folks right. so we we started a school to 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 make that happen nice and that, the how so that school you said it started about five years ago and you just merged a couple years ago. How has the, um, just in that five year span, has the curriculum evolved? Like, um, 
how well the first three years was developing the curriculum and the and the last year year and a half or so has been teaching it to our first cohort of students gotcha. so uh it hasn't evolved very much though today we were talking about changes we want to make for the next cohort so um uh uh it's it's in the process of evolving i guess yeah. um well let me I, I i took a look at the curriculum it seems very um it's very project oriented like what 80 percent of the coursework is working in teams with actually yeah but yeah, um, but how does how do you integrate content strategy into the curriculum? Are there do you tease out and, and educate people about particular aspects of content strategy, or is it just baked into the whole um, process? No, we teach the students about content very early, um, uh, and and we have a content strategy and a copywriting course, and uh, the students are taught those skills. Uh, and they are they are taught to treat copy um, as an essential core piece of the of the user experience. So they uh, they're always thinking about what the content is and and how it works. Right. Hey, that gets at something else I wanted to ask you about. There's this new title, this new job title you see floating around: UX writer. And I'm assuming that that's what you're talking, that that's like the person who's writing everything from the micro copy and labels and navigation tools and stuff out to, um, well, any kind of guidance kind of copy. But also, I guess, what do you, do you have thoughts on, you smiled a little bit when I mentioned the term, what, what, do, what do you think of that uh, term UX writer and what does it mean to you? Uh, well, what it, what, what it means to me right off is it's, if it is that it's a, uh, a technical writer that wants to get paid more, um, uh, uh, which I'm sure I'll get emails about. Um, the, uh, uh, I'm not a big fan of job roles. I think we have a lot of uh, role inflation in, in the design side of things. Um, there, you know, information architects and visual designers and researchers and, and content strategists and UX writers. Um, I think a UX writer is probably a content strategist that doesn't actually do the strategy part. Uh, so two years ago, they would have been a strategist. Two years before that, they would have been a copywriter. Um, uh, but I think that's a, that's the wrong way to think about it. I think that, that, that what we should be doing instead is um, thinking in terms of skills. So I think there's uh, a lot of writing that uh, content, written word content that has to exist inside designs. Um, if you are uh, an app, you know, say Dropbox or um, uh, Google Calendar. While neither of those technically have, you know, all the content is technically user supplied. They've got prompts and labels and a sign-in process and a up your subscription process and a setting screen and all these things that need words on them. And we can let the developers write those words. Do they have the skills to do that? We can let product managers write those words. We can get people who are trained writers to write those words. We can have those trained writers create a voice, a tone. They can, they can start to give the application a persona. Now, do they need to be called UX writer? No, you could actually have a product manager who's got those skills, who can do all those things, who would be fantastic at it. Why not? Let them do it. Or a designer or even a developer. I have met many developers in my career who are fantastic writers. And why not let them craft that? But it's a set of skills. And it's got a craft associated with it. And craft means that you have mastery associated with it. So how does someone master that, that, that set of skills? How do they master that craft? And someone can, you know, I've got a friend who loves to make um, 
uh, beer in his basement. And, and he takes great pride in the beers that he makes. And he, ma you know, he bottles a certain number every year and he gives them to his friends and he takes great. And he has gotten really good at making his beer. He's mastered his craft. But he's a software developer. And, you know, this idea that, well, software developers can't be writers. Well, software developers can't be beer makers either, I guess. I mean, I don't understand why we, they can be master beer crafters. Uh, uh, but they, but they can't be a master writer. I, I don't think that, that, that limitation exists. Right. I'm wondering, it almost then becomes more like of a management problem. If when you're putting together a team that's creating a product or an app or, or whatever it is you're doing to, to, for you, for whoever's got the ultimate authority over the, uh, putting the project together to make sure that, okay, no, we've got Joe is a, a really good programmer and he writes really well. So we have fewer needs there, uh, versus like, oh brilliant programmer, but she can't right away have a paper bag. We better bring somebody in. Is that sort of how it's manifesting or like how, because teams are, things are so collaborative nowadays. And like what you were just saying that it's, it's, there's all these, what you would call unicorns, people who embody a lot of the, of the skills in a particular milieu. But, um, do you, do you have any thoughts on the, the management process? Of like, or I, I guess it's a management issue of how you make sure that all the skills you need are involved in any one project. Right. So what you have to do is you have to, you have to do an inventory of the skills. You have to look and say, what are all the skills we need to apply to the set of problems that we're going to face? And do I have the team that, that has those skills? Are those skills present in my team? Are they present in everyone on my team? Are they present in only some of the people, but enough that I can get the project done? Are they present in too few people so that I'm always running out of resource to get important things done? Are they not present at all and we're gonna have to go outside? And one of the exercises that I do with, with teams is Take all the skills. I have them. I have them. I have these cards that list the standard skills that come for for a design team. But then I have all sorts of blank cards, and I have them write down all the things. And the things are like, you know, it might be how a newsroom editorial process works, right? How our editorial process works, and um, uh, how it changes from breaking news to sports to long form. Um, uh, thought pieces, uh, Sunday magazine stuff, right? And um, and you know how advertising works because if you have a newsroom, you probably have some sort of advertising element to it. So, do we have people with all those skills? Do we have enough people with all those skills? Do we have? Is would it be useful to have everybody have those skills? And then you can start to make a strategy around, okay, where I don't have anybody, I need to hire somebody. Where I don't have enough, I need some sort of training. Where I have decent skills, but, you know, if everybody had the skills, we'd be more efficient because, you know, um, here's the thing, right? You need a set of instructions to go above a particularly complicated idea that's now part of a new feature. And you need to somehow communicate to the user how that set of instructions work. Well, if I only have one writer on the team and that writer's off doing something else and no one else can write a, a sentence, then that part of the design has to wait until that resource frees up and I can now put that resource on that activity. Or I can interrupt them from the thing that they're doing that's probably really important and put them on this activity, but then they don't get the important thing done either. And so if I had a couple more people who could write that sentence, even if they could just do a mediocre job, maybe I don't need William Shakespeare to compose that piece of instruction. You know, maybe I just need something that is good enough to send to the usability test so that we can get some feedback on whether it's clear or not, and then we can iterate on it. And if everybody had the skills to compose sentences, if we focused on that, I could grab any free resource and have them work on that. Right. Well, that's, um, 
actually, I just looked at the clock. We're almost coming up on time, but thanks. That is, that's a whole other conversation uh, about what you were just saying, because now I want to know way more about the curriculum at Center Center. <laughs> Anyhow, I'll save that for a, a next conversation. But hey, I wanted to, before we wrap up, I wanted to give you, um, is there anything last, anything we haven't talked about or anything that's on your mind these days that you'd like to share with my, uh, with our folks while we're, while I have you here? <laughs> it's on my mind. Um, uh, we're all going to survive this. I know that. Um, uh, Thank you. <laughs> uh, I have faith uh, that that whatever this is, we will survive it. Um, uh, what would be my last thing? I mean, what I'm focused on these days is is uh, our students are are coming up. Uh, on, on what we call their residencies. Uh, so when is this show coming out? Um, this will, I'll have it up by Thursday or Friday. So oh, okay, yeah. So, so, so we're in the process of collecting companies up uh, who might want to, to have a residency with our students. A uh, residency is, is it's, an internship would not be a fair description. It's, it's more like a six-week contract than an internship. The idea is that the student comes to your organization and they – and they join a team and they tag along on that team trying to find as many ways to be useful as possible. And the, the goal is uh, for, for them to show you what they're capable of and for you to show them what your team does. Mm -hmm. And the, the idea behind all of that is uh, to give them exposure. The students do multiple residencies throughout uh, for the rest of the program before they graduate in October. And, um, uh, uh, we want them to just see what different companies are. They've been working on real world projects, so we don't need them to have project experience. They actually have quite a bit of project experience uh, that they've been working on now uh, for, for a year and a half. But uh, uh, the uh, residencies give them a chance to see what life is like outside the boundaries of the school and, and really be immersed in an organization. So that's what I'm, focused on these days so if, if organizations are interested in that that's i will certainly get the word out among like the local ux community here in seattle and and um yeah yeah because yeah, the students will travel yep uh yeah no that sounds great and i think uh i can picture a huge benefit of having because these people they've so it's just like they've essentially done most of the coursework you have and they're just kind of chomping at the bit to get going and oh they've done all the coursework at this point they're 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 done with their core courses we're now in what we call special topics and directed topics where they're really sort of refining and mastering their, their craft. Yeah. Well, certainly if only here in Seattle, I've got, there's a really active UX community here and um, yeah, I'll get the word out there and um, yeah, no, that'd be fantastic. Hopefully. Yeah. And, and among, uh, yeah, I'm just thinking of my buds at um, yeah, Facebook and Google. Anyway, yeah, I'll get that. I'll, I'll, I'll spread the word. Um, well, thanks so much, Jared. This was super great to catch up and uh, appreciate your insights and love to hold out the chat because like I said, I really did have a hundred other questions right at the very end. Well, you know, you know how to find me. Exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm the one who looks like me. Exactly. Yeah. Well, th <laughs> and you haven't changed a bit. I got to say, I, I met Jared about 20 years ago and uh, he looks the exact same and talks the exact same. I, I might have had a beard back then, but. I don't remember. Anyhow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Jared. Thank you. This is, this is a lot of fun. Thanks for encouraging my behavior. Anytime. Thank you for listening. Tune in next week for another content strategy interview.